are studying now. Oh, we have the. Good, thank you. We are now in our second in a series on it's on Pentecost and the fullness and the baptism of the Holy Spirit, an incredible theme uh, throughout the Scriptures. And if uh, there are many places in the church that have very little information or inspiration or understanding of the Holy Spirit generally. They understand things about and relate to God and God the Father. That's, that's okay, and they understand that. That's a pretty common theme. And they even, of, of course, they, they are uh, fully aware of Jesus and his part in the redemptive, redemptive story, uh, that he died on the cross, went to the, to the grave, was raised on the third day, and raised in newness of life. They've, they've got all that down. But very, very few or few have a, a really good understanding of the Holy Spirit and the Holy Spirit's part in the redemptive story and in, in church life. Uh, and Jesus addressed this in a number of places, and he, he basically was saying, uh, you know, I'm going back to the Father, and it's better that I go back to the Father because then I will send the promise of the Father. That was one of the names of the, of the Holy Spirit. He was the promise of the Father, and Jesus was going to send them. And he said, it's better that I go because when I do, I am going to send the Holy Spirit. So Jesus was going to be present with us by his Spirit. So the Holy Spirit is the, is the Spirit of Jesus. Because we have this dilemma. Say, where, do, where is Jesus right now? He's at the right hand of the Father. Say, well, uh, we say, well, I'm inviting Jesus into my heart. Now, that's, that's an interesting phrase, and we understand what it means, but you really don't find that biblically, where the apostles or others were saying, now, what you need to do is invite Jesus. This is how you get saved. You invite Jesus into your heart. Now, we understand kind of what that means, but when Peter preached on Pentecost, and the, uh, the, the question went out, what must we do to be saved? He didn't say, well, invite Jesus into your heart. <laughs> what did he say? Repent and, and believe on, on the Lord. Okay, so, so the first thing was always repentance. Well, you don't repent unless you understand that you are a sinner. So that's where it begins. We, salvation is num, number one. We have to understand and confront the fact that we are, before we're saved, we are sinners. And the, the, uh, the, the, uh, the doorknob, so to speak, of the kingdom is repentance, faith, it is by faith you're saved, right? We have, but it's by grace you're saved through faith. And, and be, in order to get through here, m part of that, that transaction is I have to repent of my sins. I have to come to that place where, where I admit that I am a sinner and I am in need of God's grace. And then I believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, that he, was, he was, died, was buried, he raised on the third day, and he sits at the right hand of the Father. Uh, okay, now, well... It, it, ask Jesus in your heart is where is, people say, well, Jesus lives in my heart. Well, yes. How does he live in a, how does he live in this temple? He lives here by the Holy Spirit, because that's the spirit of Jesus. So, so the Holy Spirit is the one who's among us. It's the spirit of Jesus. We could say in that sense it, it, that Jesus lives in our heart and that would be okay. But we have to understand that is by the Holy Spirit because Jesus is sitting at the right hand of the Father. He is in his, uh, his, his glorified state. That's where he is. He's in his glorified condition. When we go to the new Jerusalem, he's going to be on the throne. And it says the whole, the, there's no need of a son. The, the majesty and the glory of Jesus is going to radiate out and we, there's no need of a son. Uh, it's like on the Mount of Transfiguration. He was, the, he, the, he was transfigured, and the, the Shekinah glory just radiated out from him. And he said, well, now I'm going to put that radiance in you, so you become a tent or a temple that the radiance of God shines out of you. And we would, I think, in, in a lot of cases, we th well, there's not much of a re reflection of the divine in some Believers, there's something less than that. There's something diminishing that, and there's a number of reasons for that, and, and why the, the Shekinah glory is not radiating out of some believers. Uh, it may be they, they have not come to an understanding of the power in the presence of the Holy Spirit in their life. They have not potentially been filled with the Spirit. They're just not filled with the Spirit. They are filled with something, but it's not the Spirit. 
Here's something interesting, because we're talking about this event that is recorded in, in the uh, Acts 2. Let me read it to you. Uh, oh, I can go back there. In Acts chapter 2, and we all know this pretty well, but back in, let us go to Acts chapter 1, a little bit of a review, where <clears throat> Jesus is talking to the, to the believers. He's uh, raised from the dead. He showed himself alive to 500 people. He's with the, the, the disciples. We saw a little video clip on this a couple weeks ago. And being assembled together, chapter 1, verse 4, uh, with them, commanded them that they should not depart from Jerusalem, but wait. Some people say, ta he said, tarry. Wait for the promise of the Father, that's the Holy Spirit, uh, which saith he, ye have heard of me. For Julie, uh, John truly baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost not many days hence. Verse 8, of course, the famous verse, uh, you shall receive power after the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses unto me, Jerusalem, Judea, uh, Samaria, and other, other most parts of the earth. All right, then they saw him taken up in the cloud, and then we have... Uh, and verse 14, and they continued in the upper room with one accord. They were in prayer and supplication. So they were obeying. This was, you know, Pentecost came 50 days after the uh, feast of uh, uh, the first fruits, feast of first fruits. Then it was 50 days. It was seven weeks. So called, also, that feast is called the Feast of Weeks. And the Holy Spirit was to be sent down prophetically. This is a meeting to that. It was the Feast of Harvest. It was the wheat harvest. So that Pentecost was about the harvest, the harvest season. It's kind of in the summer. Passed out a couple of weeks ago. It's the end of spring, beginning of summer. It's all about this harvest. And Jesus is saying, I'm going back. It's better that I go back. Because when I'm glorified, when I'm seated there, then I'll send the Holy Spirit. Peter talks about that in chapter 4. And he said, that this is the plan of God, is the, is the fullness of the Spirit or the baptism of the Spirit. Now... I've got a, a message, sometimes I've included other messages, and, the, and it is, is, if I were the devil, if I were the devil, I'd say, uh, actually, that baptism, that fullness, that immersion is no longer for today. Uh, that, that's, that's not today. You just don't need that anymore. And uh, uh, after, the, after the, the end of the apostolic age, that was no longer needed. Of course, you'd ask the question, well, why would you not need the power of the Spirit of God? But this will be, a, this is a heresy, actually, uh, is this is a false doctrine. In uh, 1 uh, Timothy 4, 1, it says, uh, in the end times, many will depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. Okay, so devils have doctrines, and those doctrines are, are inf infiltrate the church, and many people pick up false doctrines, but they're, they're not God's doctrines. And one of them is the doctrine of cessationism. Cessationism is simply meaning that there's no longer a fullness and baptism of the Spirit. There's no more uh, uh, the gifts of the Spirit and the miraculous happenings. All of that is gone. It's no longer a part of our experience. That is a doctrine of devils. Now it goes on to say, uh, Paul talks, uh, writes to Timothy in 2 Timothy chapter 3, and he says this, perilous times will come, in the end time, perilous times will come, because men will be lovers of them, own, of them own selves. That's the big problem. And after that comes the manifestation of that self-love. And he ends it with this. He said, what will happen is there will be those who have a form of godliness, but they will deny what? The power. So they're going to deny the power. That's just a, a way of saying they will deny the power of the Holy Spirit. That's why that's a, that's a doctrine. Now here's the problem with it. The problem is, and I find this with many people that I, I deal with over time, that people have a very strong be belief, and, and oftentimes it is, it is error. But they've, uh, they have embraced a belief system, and they, they believe it, but it's, it's a wrong belief system. But when you have... Uh, you know, there's a religious component that comes with this because those kind of folks will not, will not even address or look at the possibility that their doctrine may be wrong. For instance, cessationism. I grew up Lutheran, and we were, we were warned about the, uh, the folks up at the corner, and they were, I think it was an assembly, it was assembly of God, and that they were like weird people up there. And uh, they were... Uh, 
you know, they spoke in tongues and you need to stay away from those people. So I was actually taught that it was, it was something wrong with those people and you wouldn't go up there. Well, we had some folks, other folks in the church who uh, would sneak up there and they took us. Remember those folks? And they'd say, come on up there, uh, up to the Assemblies of God. And it was a different environment from the Lutheran Church. I mean, they were raising their hands, saying amen, you know, the things that we would commonly understand to do. But it was a real barrier for me to, to it's better to, to, for Kathy, she's gonna, she's going here, she, but I didn't go there. She said, let's go with them here, let's go with them there, let's go to the house church here, let's say, okay, you know, whatever, and I'd go along. So it took me a while to unlearn the things. So, because you get a, in a traditional, doctrinal system, and it's very hard, that tradition, you, it, it confronts the Word of God and it will, not, it will not change. It'll say, no, I'm not going to believe that because I believe this. It says, uh, you know, I believe what I believe, don't confuse me with the facts. It's like, what, what, no, it's written right here, it's, it's black and white and sometimes red and white, but it's right here in front of you. I don't care, I believe this. Now you're, that person is, they may go to heaven, but they're not going to break through. I wanted a breakthrough. In other words, my, my approach to the kingdom was whatever is here, I want as much as I can get out of this. I want, just we say, just more. I, I just want more. I'm, there was a dissatisfaction with what I had. Was before being Lutheran, it was just a, a, a religious system. And then you get saved, and you say, well, I'm born again, and so forth, and now I'm good, and now, now I have to work out of the, of the bad doctrine. I've got to work out of that. Uh, and that took a little time for me, and Kathy was very instrumental, because in, she didn't have the baggage. She didn't have, she was not the uh, traditional churchgoer, though she, my grandma took her to church and was a great inspiration, but she wasn't as deeply entrenched in the religious system doctrinally as I was. Right? So, but, but the thing that makes the difference is you have the hunger. You, you have the, I, I want more, what, show me the truth, Lord. I, and, you know, you find the scriptures say, well, Jesus said, if you ask, if you ask the Lord for, for a, a, a bread, he's not going to give you a stone. Or he's going to ask you, he's not going to give you a servant. And then he goes on to say, if, if you ask God for the, for the Holy Spirit, he's not going to give you something false. I said, okay, so I'm going to ask for it. And, uh, and I have testified before that when I was baptized and filled with the Holy Spirit, I mean, everything opened up. Everything, there was a freedom, and it, it, but it's a, it's, a, it's a process, especially if you have wrong doctrine. It's a, it's a, it's a process. So uh, th that's very important to understand that. So going back here, and it says, uh, chapter 2, And when the day of Pentecost was fully come, and they were all with one accord in one place. Now that's important. They're in the upper room, and there is a, there's a hunger there. They, they've been in prayer for... Ten days, because Pentecost came 50 days after first fruits, and Jesus was among them, teaching them and showing himself alive for 40 days. So there's 10 days there in the upper room praying. <clears throat> and they are obeying. There's a couple things here to receiving the baptism of the Holy Spirit. They were obeying. They were waiting. They were not going to quit. They, were, they said, go and wait. Now, why didn't, why didn't he, the Lord give them the Holy Spirit uh, in one day? Why not two days or, th or three? I mean, why wasn't it faster? He said, we're going to find out really how much you want this. I think that may be part of it. Because they were sitting around for the first day, second day. They're in the upper room, you know, getting a, a, a Uber the driver to bring them, the, bring them their meals. You know, they're waiting on the Lord and they're praying. And it's like, okay, it's how many days we've been praying here? Three days, four. And uh, I, no telling, there's 120 of them up there, right? 120 said, some of them would go say, but this isn't working. Say, shut up, sit down, and keep praying. And somebody had to inspire them. They had to wait. So the, the concept there is oftentimes, and, and for me it was this way, I'm, I'm after this experience, not for the experience, but for more of the, of the presence of God. That was the whole thing. Just more, more Lord. It was more. It wasn't so I could do a certain thing or have a particular gift. It was just more of God. Well, it was a journey, and I'm waiting, and I'm looking, and I'm going here and there. And I was at, uh, we were at a, one of these big Jesus festivals in Pennsylvania, Mercer, I think it was, 50,000 people. And, and it was in that environment that that's where it happens. Boom. And because you're hungry, and you're, you've been waiting, and you're waiting, and you say, I, I, I'm, 
And the whole idea, I want more. If that baptism in the Holy Spirit, which I was learned that was no, not today, was not today, and you don't need it or wasn't even addressed, and I didn't know who the Holy Spirit was or what his function was, that he was the, he was the one that was actually present in my life, if he was in this temple. He was the governor. He was the leader. That's the one we're dealing with. It's the Spirit of Jesus, but it's the Holy Spirit that's working among us. He's in heaven at the right hand of the Father. Of course, they are three in one, and it's a perfect picture. But uh, I didn't know anything about the Holy Spirit. Uh, the, uh, there's a, and here's an amazing thing. There's, first John, there's a, uh, this, this scripture. See if I can find it for you. And in there, it says, there are three that testify uh, in heaven. And it says, and it's the, the Father, the, 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 the Word, and the Holy Spirit. And that scripture has been taken out of the modern Bibles. It's the only, it's the only place where the, uh, the Holy Spirit is uh, particularly addressed in the Word directly. And uh, it's, it's in 1 John. I'm um, looking through my, my copious notes here to see if I can find it. But I should have marked it. But it's been taken out. Now you think about that, uh, the number... Uh, you know, one of the Bibles was taken, 43 verses have taken out of the, one of the most popular Bibles, 43 verses, uh, just taken out, gone. And that was one of them. And you, boy, I hate it when I can't find stuff. But anyway, that is, I'll get it for you next week. It's right in here. Uh, so if I were the devil, I'd kind of, Holy Spirit, you would kind of get that out of here because that's the power of God. You shall receive power after that the Holy Spirit comes upon you. So, going on, it says, and suddenly, now this is what happened with me. Suddenly, you don't know when it's going to happen, but you're after it. That's the key. You've got to be after this. And some of you already uh, have had this experience. There came a sound from heaven. We saw the video a couple weeks ago. As of a rushing mighty wind and the whole house there was filled uh, they, where they were sitting. They were, appeared to them cloven tongues like a fire and it sat on each one of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues or languages. We could say that as the spirit gave them utterance and the, uh, the, the noise, verse six, uh, went abroad. In other words, that was uh, heralded what was happening and the multitudes came together together. I'm, I'm just jumping here. They were all amazed and marveled and they, they did hear them speak in their own languages. The wonderful works of God. That's what they were talking about. The wonderful works of God. I said, wow. Uh, and from there, uh, it said, what, what meaneth this? And Peter goes to Joel 2.28, which was the promise. And he said, it shall, and he, he quotes it. And, and he said, this is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel. And it shall come to pass in the last days, saith God, that I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. Your sons and daughters shall prophesy. Your young men shall see visions. Your old men dream dreams. And there's more of that prophecy spoken here. Now, I said, okay, it's right in the Bible there. And then there are five places where the Holy Spirit fell five years later, 10 years later, 20 years later. In different places, it was among the Jews, it was among the Gentiles in Ephesus. And the Holy Spirit is falling and there's a manifestation. Something happens to the people. And I always uh, look at it this way. When, you're, when a person is baptized in the Holy Spirit, there may be a variety of manifestations, but you know it. That something happens and whether it's you feel warm love or you feel, uh, you know, you've dropped to your feet or there's joy or you, you speak in an unknown tongue or there's a variety of manifestations. And we'll talk about that in, an, in another session because we're going to stay with this subject because it's so vital, especially in the time that we're living. All right. So it's getting a little later here. So I want to show you a little bit of a, uh, an object lesson. I do this pretty much every year. So some of you go are saying, oh, not that again. Well, yeah. But there are some people here who have not seen this uh, incredible demonstration. And I, I, I was going to do this. I just didn't, never got around to it. But this, this is, this is, I used to put, this is you. Okay? <laughs> this is so powerful. You'll, you'll, you'll never, you can't not remember this. And uh, here's you. And you just got saved, and you're, uh, you're, you're, you're walking with the Lord. 
uh, and you, Jesus said, uh, when he, after he came back, right, after he was raised from the dead, he was among the disciples, and it said, and he breathed on them and said, receive ye the, receive ye the Holy Spirit. This is what? Holy Spirit. This is, this is you, all right? Holy Spirit, you. This is a very crude object lesson, but it has some truth to it, obviously. So, okay, you have Holy Spirit. You can see it right there. So, the problem is that this is uh, going to be, metaphorically, this is filled. You're a vessel, and I don't have the time to put all of the little stones in here. But think of it as filled with these stones and rocks right up to the top. And, uh, uh, you know, you're, 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 you're filled with something here. Uh, you feel, well, you have a lot of, let's play there. you have a lot of stones in you, and you're saved, and you have the Holy Spirit. Jesus. And I think that's when people got, post-resurrection, they got saved. There's a lot of different views of that, but Jesus, he breathed on them, said, receive now the Holy Spirit. He never had done that before. They had been, they had been uh, inspired by the Holy Spirit, but they had not been indwelt by the Holy Spirit uh, in, in the way that we understand it. So he said, they got saved. When you're saved, do you have the Holy Spirit in you? Yeah, you, you can't have not have the Holy Spirit united with your, your human spirit. But then he says, but now go into Jerusalem and wait. Now why, say, if you got the Holy Spirit, why would you have to go and now wait to get baptized and filled? Two weeks ago, I showed another demonstration that had to do with a sponge. Remember the sponge? And you put some water in it and say, okay, oh, that's water in it. But it, it, that was it. Well, now I keep pouring it in there, and pretty soon it gets saturated and it starts dripping. And that's what, that's what that word means uh, when it says filled. It means, filled is that you feel to, you, you're saturated. Saturated with the Holy Spirit. So it's a, I'm thinking, this is a good thing, right? This is a good thing. I want saturated. How many want saturated? Uh, we call, you could rename the church, the saturation church. You know, <laughs> Holy Ghost saturation. So, I hope I have enough water here. So anyway, here's the... Uh, Here's the, well, I'm the vessel, but I want, I want, I've got the Holy Spirit, but I want to be what? I want to be filled. So I go and I'm seeking and I, I'm after the Lord and there's a time in my life where the Holy Spirit comes upon me and I've been tarrying, I've been waiting, and guess what happens? I get what? Cassandra, go get me more water. She's my... My water. I thought that would be enough. So, so now, and you don't have to put half, just half of that, okay? So now I am being, I'm quite not, not quite filled here, you know, but think about that. Well, the, the, uh, the demonstration broke down there. I didn't plan that well enough. But in this vessel, you'll see, are, there's some things in there. And they are, these rocks represent something. And these, these stones in there represents things in my life that are contrary to the kingdom of God. And I'm saved, but there are things God wants to deal with me on some of these aspects of my character and my nature and my lifestyle. And he said, I'm going to, ch I, I'm going to work with you. If you work with me and if you want filled, you cannot be filled until there's a part of you that gets what? Emptied. All right. Filling and emptying are related, but you have to have, thank you so much. All right, now I'm gonna get filled here. Here we go, I am now, woo, I am filled. The question is, is a, a, this is the Holy Spirit, am I filled with the Holy Spirit? Yes and, a, and no, because I have some of these things in my life that have to be dealt with. Now here's where, the, here's where your part is to say, Lord, and when Paul said in, in, uh, in, to the Ephesians, he said, go on being filled with the Spirit. I said, go on. Because when you get filled with the Spirit, it is, uh, it, it, he, when you expend spiritual energy, uh, you have to be refilled. You're expending, because the Holy Spirit is energy. When you're ministering, you're, you're expending energy, and you have to be in the presence of the Lord to, to continue. He said, go on being filled. Chapter 4 you know, that Peter was off, you know, ministering and the, and the, uh, uh, the officials brought him and, and arrested him. And he is now using that 
energy. He comes back to the, to the church and he explains everything that happened. And they start praising God and they start crying out to the Lord and saying, Lord, fill us. Listen to this. Uh, and now, Lord, behold their threatenings and grant unto thy servants that with all boldness they may speak uh, thy, thy word by stretching forth thy hand to heal and that signs and wonders may be done by the name of thy holy child Jesus. Here's the hunger part. This is what makes the whole thing move. This is like the, 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 uh, the catalyst behind the whole, the whole move of God, that hunger. And when they had prayed, the place, everybody say when they had prayed. See, when they had prayed, the place was shaken, and they were assembled together, and they were all, what? Filled with the Spirit. Well, I thought they were filled before, on, on Acts 2, they were filled. So why do they need to be? You see, it's, a, it's an ongoing impartation of divine power. That's the whole point. And when they were assembled, they were all filled with the Holy Ghost, and they spake the word of God with boldness. See, that's that spiritual energy. But it's not, it's the, it's the desire to do it. Because the whole plan was the Father sends the Son. The Son manifests who the Father is. He works in miracles, shows us what we're supposed to do, right? How we're supposed to live, right? And then he goes back to heaven. He says, I'm going to go send my spirit to live in you that you do what I was doing which was preaching, Luke 14, 18, it says, And the Spirit of the Lord God is upon me because He has anointed me, Holy Spirit, remember Jesus when He was baptized, what comes out of heaven? Holy Spirit, He's filled, He goes into the wilderness, comes out of the wilderness in the power of the Spirit, He's tried, tested, He said, The Spirit of God is upon me because He has anointed me. He's in the temple, and He's reading from the Torah, He's reading from the Old Testament. Uh, not, not the Torah, it's, it's uh, Isaiah 61. And he's saying, the Spirit of the Lord God, and he has anointed me. What's the anointing for? For ministry. The anointing is the fullness of the Spirit. I'm anointed to do ministry and to preach the gospel to the poor, recovery of sight to the blind, set at liberty those that are bruised, and set the captives free, uh, proclaim the acceptable, acceptable year of the Lord. That's what the Holy Spirit does. That's the plan. Father sends the Son, Son sends the Spirit, and you and I become Jesus to the, to the planet. And then we go and we do what Jesus did. If we don't have the, that hunger, you be a religious person and you not even think about other people hardly. You not even, you not even open your mouth. You don't have any boldness because you have no power. You, got, you don't have the energy, the, the chutzpah of the Holy Ghost. That's a Jewish word. It means energy. Uh, if you don't have that, if that's not a part of that, you, you really need to get before the Lord and say, Lord, I'm, I'm missing a, a really significant component. Because life is mostly about me, and this is the enemy is the I in me. So here's the problem here. Uh, I need some deliverance here because it says, Godly sorrow worketh re repentance unto salvation. Salvation is spirit, soul, and body, but it's a very strong component is deliverance. Because there are things stuck in you that are hindering you. They may be things as profound but as simple as, I feel I am a failure, I'm no good, I'm not worthy. That's, that's, that's you. That's out of your carnal man. And the Lord's going to come and he, and he deals with you. He says, what, that's, that's unbelief already because you're a prince or you're a princess, you're special, and a Holy Ghost is in you and you have no fear of men, and, the lithic, and you say, uh, Lord, I repent of that, and you get delivered. Now, when you get delivered, here we go, you just got delivered of that problem. And the Lord comes and deals with you because you're hungry. You see, you're, you're actually saying, Lord, I want to be something more. I'm not living in this bondage because this is all bondage. And the more I am delivered from those dilemmas, guess what? Now I can be filled. See, we're all filled with something. Either it's the Holy Ghost, or it's me, or my problems, my issues, or my sin. When, if you, if when we're in a, living in a certain sin in our life, we're, we're going to drain this thing right out of here. Not even know how, even how to show that. But here's what we'll do. We'll, we, will grieve, we will grieve the Holy Spirit. And uh, let me give you those two verses as we, as we end here. I was going to preach to you, uh, 
three hours of notes. <laughs> I was trusting that the Holy Spirit would show me which way to go with this. Listen to this. And uh, this is Ephesians 4, 30. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God, God by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Now, you can, because uh, the Holy Spirit is a person. Jesus said when he comes, when he fills, it's, it's a personal pronoun. Only it's don't get personal he's, right? So maybe they, maybe we, we have to check with heaven and see which pronouns he wants to use up there. I don't know. It's a joke. No? Okay. But by him, he said, you can grieve the Spirit. The Holy Spirit in you, you can grieve him. By what? How, how could, would you grieve the Holy Spirit? By sin? By acting unbecomingly? By not carrying the anointing? I think of it this way. By not allowing the Holy Spirit, the gifts of the Holy Spirit, which are Jesus' life, to be manifest in and through you. That grieves the Holy Spirit. He said, I want to use you and the gifts that are uniquely given to you, a, 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 a manifestation of Jesus' ministry. That's the point. It's Jesus' ministry, and you say, no, I'm not going to let any kind of ministry come out of me. I'm just going to be a religious person. Now, you're grieving the Holy Spirit because you can't be used. You're, you're not, you, life, because life is about me and my problems and my issues, so I don't, have, I don't have fullness, I don't have boldness, I'm not even thinking about the souls of others, or rarely. I can't even open my mouth. I can't speak. I can't talk to somebody. I don't know the scriptures. Grieving the Holy Spirit. That's number one. Number two is 1 Thessalonians 5.19. Do not quench the Holy Ghost. Don't, don't quench. That means to, it's like putting a wet blanket on the Holy Ghost. Now, if you don't have much of Holy Ghost, you know, this, this is almost, it's, it, it's still a grief to the Holy Spirit. It's, you, you say, well, I'm not, I'm not into that Holy Ghost stuff. You're quenching. It means to suppress and subdue. You know, you can subdue the, the, the divinity of God by saying, no, you're not working through me. All those gifts, and I, uh, I've been taught that those gifts are not for today, so that's it. Uh, we're done with those things. Quenching the Holy Spirit. He said, do not. These are do not, do not. Do not grieve, do not quench. Do not, do not. Why? Because the Holy Spirit wants to be active in your life. He wants a manifestation of the sons of God. And the only way you get that is by the fullness of the Spirit. So let the Lord work in your life here, you know. Here's the Lord, the conviction of the Holy Spirit. You need to get some more stuff out of there. Maybe today, you know, who knows. It's just a, that's a, just a little one, you know, but I got a little more Holy Ghost, right? And you stay filled. You got to do it daily. You got to stay with this. You can't go, oh, you know, I got baptized in the Spirit back in. That's like, oh, I got saved when I was six, but I do nothing now. Is that what? That's not even nothing. It's, uh, and, and it's sad that many Christians are in that place. And that's why when Jesus said the, the, the harvest is plenteous, Pentecost, harvest, the harvest is plenteous, but the laborers are, are few. Why? There's no energy. There's no power. Because they bought into the lie, a, 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 a lie, a doctrine that says it's no longer for today. And they go to 1 Corinthians 8 and say, well, uh, you know, uh, tongues are going to pass away and knowledge and all this. And it's a reference to the millennium. Not now. It's like a misplaced one doctrine. You need like you usually two or three to establish a doctrine. You get one little thing and it doesn't even make sense to the rational mind. But doctrinally, people believe it. They say, yeah, we got it out of this. That, that doesn't even say that. How can you actually believe that? It's a religious doctrine that people embrace. So that's it until next week. This is, uh, this is two, number two in the series. I hope you got something out of that. And uh, hallelujah. Glory to God. All right, put on uh, Miss, Miss Patricia, thank you, that uh, song for me. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this, uh, this time, these few minutes, Lord, to discuss this subject and uh, Lord I pray that Holy Spirit will be coming upon this church upon us in, a, in even a greater way Lord in a greater way more profound way
Spirit for being here. Trust that you have spoken what you wanted to speak. That was my prayer, Lord, that you would speak. You would just use me as a mouthpiece to say what you want to say. And Lord, that it would be truth and it would be correct and it would be right. And that would have an impact on your people, Lord. And I just pray for a growing hunger among us, Lord, a hunger for more of you, a hunger to be filled with the Spirit of the living God, the precious Holy Spirit. We honor your presence here, Jesus, by your Holy Spirit. We say, Holy Spirit, you are governor. You are our guide. You're our helper. Our guide. You glorify Jesus. You empower us. You lead us. We thank you for that, Lord. So I lift each one who is here this morning, Lord, to you. May this word ring in their spiritual ears, Lord, even over these days ahead. So the Lord bless you and keep you, and the Lord's face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. And the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Shalom. Peace in Jesus' name. And all the saints said, Amen.